welcome to everyone here in Bonn to our transdisciplinary conference Characters in Mind, my creation of characters in ancient Jewish, ancient Christian and Greco-Roman literature and art. An equally warm welcome to those of you who are joining us tonight to one of our social media channels or to those who are watching this sometime later as it's simply too early or too late right now. My name is Jan Brueggemeyer and I teach New Testament here at the Bonn and I'm also co-organizer of this conference together with my Regensburg colleague Tobias Nickler. It's an exceptional honor for me to welcome Laura Suzanne Lieber to this public lecture here in Bonn, and this even more as her contextual approach to ancient work has inspired my own work as I share the interest in popular literature and how ancient readers actually read or read and heard these texts and what interested them about it. Dr. Laura Suzanne Lieber is professor of religious studies, classical studies, German studies, which I only recently discovered, and divinity. Besides that, she is director of the for Jewish studies at Duke. Driven by a strong interest on how regular Jews, as Laura calls it, read the Hebrew Bible, her work has been interested in Jewish liturgy poetry, which she then also relates and compares to liturgical poetry to other communities of the same time. That is, in her case, the fourth to sixth century of the Common Era. Furthermore, she brings those texts then in dialogue with religious performances in late antiquity, influenced by ancient theater, oratory, and popular entertainment. Of the many books and articles that Laura has written, and which cannot be mentioned here in their entirety, I would like to draw attention to her most recent book on the evocative, yet largely unknown tradition of cemeterian religious poetry, published in 2022, and her translation and commentary on Jewish and Aramaic poetry from late antiquity, published in 2018, which finally, her fine and inspiring book on the vocabulary of desire, the Song of Song in the early synagogue, also published with Brill in 2014. Laura's talk tonight is auspiciously titled In Our Image, Transforming Esther in Every Age. Laura, it's my great pleasure to have you with us here tonight in Bonn at our conference and live streaming event. I look forward to your lecture and turn the floor over to you. Thank you very much. I would very much like to thank Jan and uh, Michael for the invitation to share uh, this adventure with you. Thank you. Um, I hope everyone enjoys In this lecture, we will follow Esther's public presence through centuries and across ages. We will examine her origins for the Hebrew Bible and consider the early Jewish tradition. We'll 
as for the youth generation Z, the time is ripe. Ideas for femininity, power, self-determination, but also Jewish and Christian identity. Esther makes us conscious of how we reveal and conceal ourselves in a specific setting, at public and private spaces. Esther can serve so many functions because being in her own is specifically tasked with playing so many roles. Cousin and queen, Jew and Persian, submissive and subversive, modest and seductive, deferential and bold. A study of Esther and the many ways her character changes and develops over time helps us understand the ubiquity of performance and, and a self-consciousness of where one's power, vulnerability, and value reside. This evening, Esther, as others imagined her, and in doing so, how they revealed something of themselves. This ubiquity is appropriate of Sheba, although we can only sample in a religious way as her reading there. So we begin with the biblical origins of Esther, and I have here a from the second century BCE of a goddess, a hero, a song that we can all recite. So with that image, we see the name Esther, which also connected to Ishtar, and the ancient rabbinic literature she connected with Ayala Bashtar, the morning star. So we see here sort of some sub some sub resonances of Esther guiding us. So I have here a structural analysis, indeed, of the book that highlights her own motif. Because as I say here, the scriptures version on the script. There are lots of coincidences, no accidents, and the story that from generation after generation we find almost begging to be performed. So we have here the vision of the great and evil Persian king Ahasuerus. We see the mirror images of how I see the bookended by the verses hero Mordecai. Then we have the mirror and two banquets, the first hosted by Persians, the second hosted by Jews. We see the king's tomb and two shrines. It's Esther, who steals her Jewish identity when she becomes the queen of Persia, which is not revealed in the book. And I think the story rides on that and teaching of her identity. And then when the Persian leader tells the Jews to cleanse themselves, then we are told that the enemy of the people of Persia, Mithyahadi, that they and it's not clear exactly what that means, um, but that's, I think, one of the parts of the book that is just really why we found funniest, because historically speaking, doing yourself is sort of laughing at something to do with it. You have the elevation of Haman and the elevation of Mordecai. You have pivotal talks, pivotal edicts, and then we have, sort of as we get close to the fulcrum of the book, you have Esther hosts two banquets. Favor. What does this look like? It's a gift, and this is to have a party. It's a gift to King Haman, who is the king of the Jews, who is doing the deed. And then, and then at the second banquet, it's going to be revealed in the Jewish plot, and everything that Haman has been plotting unravels. And in the middle of the book, the fulcrum is the chapter where Mordecai, Mordecai is being honored by the king to have life back in chapter 2. Haman is asked by the king, um, how would you treat the person that the king wishes to honor? And Haman answers, well, he's the one who's about to be honored. Uh, he describes a very lavish parade in which the king's honor. And then he is told that the parade is not for him. The parade is, in fact, for his uh, Mordecai. And that's where we get the whole thing that we can see in Hebrew and Latin. So as you can see here, there's almost a careful, there's a structure, there's both a specific setting of season as a story, but it also conveys a sense of stage. And it has to do with a sense of scene and cutting back and forth to the scene where the characters are introduced, and how they're introduced, and the tableau that they're created. And that's one reason why I think we see so many visual themes of the book of Esther. To illustrate for you the drama of the book itself, and one reason why I think so many ways it is not just robotic and actually performance, we have here just a few verses from chapter 7. 
Esther replied, this is from the biblical text, if your majesty will give me this favor, and if it pleases your majesty, let my life be granted to me and my goods, and let your people grant my request, for we have been sold by Pharaoh Cotton to be destroyed, massacred, were we only to be sold as slaves, I would accept the child, for a trifle is not worthy of the king's mother. Whereupon King Ahasuerus demanded of the king Esther, who is she? Where is she who dares to do this? The adversary and enemy replied, Esther, is this evil Haman? This is a stage for Calvin this morning. And Haman cringed in terror at the insolence of the king. The king's fury had left the wine palace for the palace garden, and Haman remained to plead with King Esther for his life, for he saw the king's resolve to destroy him. When the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet room, Haman is lying prostrate on the couch where Esther reclined. Does Haman, cried the king, mean to ravish the queen in my own palace? No sooner did these words leave the king's lips than Haman stayed dead. So here we have it all. Sex, death, violence, betrayal, revelation of disguise, all in one package of three verses. Now, Esther's an easy book for someone who loves story to love. But it's not always an easy book for someone who wants to think about it as scripture to interpret. So we have here, for example, in 1837, the Reverend J.W. Nidlock, headmaster of London High School, concisely summarized traditional objections to Esther in his preface to a work curiously aimed at proselytizing Jews, precisely to appeal to the previously dismissed, perhaps as too Jewish, Book of Esther. So as you can see here from the cover of the book, that it's about Mordecai and Esther, the Savior and his church. And as uh, the Reverend Dublock outlines here, Esther contains no promise to the church, makes no mention of the gospel, has no type of prophecy of the Messiah, does not once introduce the name of God or recognize his providence, reveals none of those precious and fundamental doctrines found elsewhere in the Old Testament, and it is not quoted in the New Testament. So here we have many obstacles. And indeed, in fact, obstacles in the world of Judaism as well. And rabbinic sources reflect an awareness that Esther is unusual, especially for this failure to mention God. But ultimately, in part because of the holiday of Purim, perhaps exclusively because of the holiday of Purim, that it is in the wake of the entire introduction to, it wins a permanent place in the Jewish Canon, except for it's obviously famously not one, the one book of the Hebrew Bible that's not accepted among the Dead Sea Scrolls. There is a wonderful uh, uh, April Fool's Day column in thetorah.com claiming to have found the Dead Sea Scrolls version of Esther. That's how ludicrous it is to imagine. We see also that Martin Luther wrote in, 15, in the 1530s, I am so hostile to this book, 2nd Maccabees, which is the book that has the etiology of Hanukkah, to this book and to Esther, they did not exist at all, for they Judaized too greatly and contained much heathen naughtiness. So, I have to, I have to love heathen naughtiness. And then, half a millennium later, we still, uh, uh, this, in, this introduction to the canonical book of the Old Testament, uh, that E.H. Cornhill writes, all the worst and most unpleasing features of Judaism are here displayed without disguise. And only in Alexandria was it felt absolutely necessary to cover up the ugliest bare places with a few religious patches. To which I would respond, this problem is another opportunity. And indeed, we see that the Greek additions to Esther are an example of how the original source material could be, you might say, translated and improved, in that it, is, it adds what was felt to be lacking to the Hebrew text, which can consist of piety, there's much God, much prayer, distressed damsels, and even dream sequences. And so here again, you can see how the sort of structure of the traditional sort of Greek edition to the Greek version of the book of Esther. So Mordecai has a dream vision prophecy of two dragons fighting in the sky. That again is very exciting. My kids will be very into that. And at the end of the book, again, the sort of chiastic structure, we have Mordecai's dream vision prophecy is explained. So we're told that it was a, it was a, a dream about his fight with Haman coming. 
It adds the text of the royal decree, uh, the first the decree condemning the Jews, and then the text of the decree condemning Haman, and requires the eight Jews made offense. And then sort of the middle two editions are in some ways the most religiously significant, and perhaps the most profoundly significant, in that we have in, the, in addition to Mordecai's prayer and Esther's prayer, which they utter upon learning that this decree has been uh, dis, dis, um, uh, delivered, uh, condemning the Jews to death and extermination. And then in addition D, we have entrance to the royal court unbidden, which the book tells us, in a very fanciful understanding of Persian court etiquette, Esther says she cannot go to the king unbidden because to do so would be to be put to, would mean that she's eligible to be put to death for, for, for intruding upon the king, and she decides to do so anyway. And I want to look just briefly at this scene as an example of performance uh, and the way these traditions amplify the performative. So here we have Esther 5, verses 1 and 2, in Hebrew, the Hebrew text is in gray, in translation, and then the uh, Greek edition is below it, not in gray. So the Hebrew says, On the third day Esther put on royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's palace, facing the king's palace, while the king was sitting on his royal throne in the throne room, facing the entrance to the palace. As soon as the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, she won his favor. The king extended to Esther the golden scepter, which he had in his hand, and then Esther approached the tip of the scepter. So again, very visual. We can imagine so that exactly who's facing where, how they're standing, who moves and who doesn't move, and exactly what the actions are. So again, that's the sort of staging sense of the Hebrew text. The Greek says, oh, I can do better. On the third day, when she ended her piety, she took off the garments in which she had worshipped and arrayed herself in splendid attire, then majestically adorned, after invoking the aid of the all-seeing God and Savior, she took two maids with her. On one she leaned gently for support, while the other followed, carrying her train. She was radiant with perfect beauty, and she looked happy, as if beloved, but her heart was frozen with fear. When she'd gone all through the doors, she stood before the king. He was seated on his throne, clothed in the full array of all his majesty, all covered with gold and precious stones. He was most terrifying. Lifting his face flushed with splendor, he looked at her in fierce anger. The queen faltered and faint and collapsed on the head of the maid who went in front of her. Then God changed the spirit of the king to gentleness, and in alarm he sprang from his throne and took her up in his arms until she came to herself. He comforted her with soothing words and said to her, What is it, Esther? I am your husband. Take courage. You shall not die, for our law only applies to our subjects. Come near. Then he raised the golden scepter and touched her neck with it. He raised her and said, Speak to me. She said to him, I saw you, my lord, like an angel of God. And my heart was shaken with fear at your glory. For you are wonderful, my lord, and your countenance is full of grace. And while she was speaking, she fainted and fell. So we've gone from drama to melodrama. So that's how the, the Jews of Alexandria covered up its bare patches and improved it. Now, from these textual traditions that are ultimately forms of scripture, we move now to late antiquity, this period from the third to the sixth or seventh century where these texts are represented in the synagogue context in two particular genres, Aramaic translations, and translation is a very loose word here, really Aramaic versions, uh, and uh, synagogue poetry, piutim. So we have two primary Aramaic versions of Esther, and they're like the Greek editions, but even more so. Um, and here I have a 19th century Persian translation, a manuscript, so you can see how the Targums, these Aramaic versions on their own became significant texts that were copied and recopied and transmitted. And of course, the fact that it's Persian is an extra nice resonance, and so is Esther. So it's easier to show you Targum than to tell you about Targum. So here's a verse, the Masoretic text, the Hebrew version of Esther 3.8, Haman's accusation against the Jews. Haman then said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the other peoples in all the provinces of your realm, whose laws are different from those of any other people and who do not obey the king's laws, and it is not worthwhile for the king to tolerate 
them. Okay. The first Targum, Targum Rishon, is the more conservative of the two extant Aramaic Targums. And this is the full text of its version of that verse. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, there is a certain people scattered and distinct among the nations. Some of them live throughout all the provinces of the kingdom. The decrees of their law are different from those of every nation. Our bread and our cooked dishes they do not eat. Our wine, our festivals they do not celebrate, and our customs they do not observe. So notice how he's fleshing out here more of what it is they do that keeps them separate from us. Nor do they observe the decrees of the king's statutes, and the king has no profit from them. What benefit does he have? from them and he lets them live on the face. So this is the Aramaic version of that verse, that Hebrew verse from the first part in Targum Rishon. This is part of Targum Sheni, the second Targum version of that verse. And I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because it's really long. But I want to highlight for you here some of the ways that this Targum expresses Jewish difference. Because I think you can see in this the way that Jews, in some way, are mocking what they know other people say about them. Again, there's, there's sort of an, uh, there's a, a, a knowingness to this text about how precisely the Jews are, in a way, not good citizens, and the kinds of things that other people say about them. Some of these, I think, are still said to this day. So we have here, they do service of the king. When they see us, they spit on the ground and consider us as something defiled. They do not give us their daughters and do not take our daughters in marriage. So their exclusiveness, which is all very ironic in the context of Esther having, Esther having married the Persian king. Um, the day they want to buy from us, lawful day, but the day we want to buy from them, they close the markets and say to us, it's a holiday. The first hour of mourning they say we must recite the Shema. The second they say we must offer prayers. The third they say we must eat our bread. And the fourth, they say, we have to bless God of heaven who gave us bread and water. The fifth, they go out. The sixth, they return. And in the seventh hour, their wives come to them and say, we have brought you a dish of beans. You must be in distress from your service. So the, basically, you can never actually do business with the Jews because they're always saying it's a holiday. And if you've ever been uh, attempted to sort of plan something with someone involved in Judaism or Jewish studies in the month of September, that is indeed how it can feel. So then we have on the eighth day, they circumcise the foreskins of their sons. And then finally they say, we are the descendants of world famous ancestors. We do not subject ourselves nor bow down to kings, nor do we listen to rulers. We are the descendants of pious and good people, world famous. However, there is no needier people than they in the world. So in this Aramaic version of that verse, you can hear accusations that surely the author of this text heard others make about Jews, which from a Jewish perspective, would not be accusations at all. They're pious, they're keeping, they're observing the dietary laws and the marriage laws, they're circumcising their sons and, um, and revering their ancestors. But as Haman spins it, these become damning charges. So these were the Aramaic Targums, and it's hard to read them without gesturing and being uh, entertaining. Then we have in a liturgical poetry, I just want to sort of give here a few snippets. This is an Aramaic Aramaic poem. It was probably paraliturgical, performed sometime in the context of Purim. But it's actually in the voice of Zeresh, Haman's wife, and she is lamenting uh, Haman's foolish plan, which got all of ten sons and her husband executed for their plotting against the life of the queen and her people, even though initially he put up the gallows hole because of Zeresh's advice. But that was before Zeresh knew he was Jewish. So as soon as Zeresh knows that he is a Jew or a Judean, she says, you should really cancel these plans, but it was really too late by then. So this is a poem in the voice of Zeresh in which she joins the community at Purim in mocking the name, cursing the name Haman. Uh, so it's a, it's a common ritual. You know, so whenever the name Haman is said in the synagogue during the reading of the scroll, people say boo or they stomp on the floor, or they clap, they clap rocks together, they have noisemakers. You're, you're blotting out the name of Haman with your, with your voice. And in a way, this poem has Zeresh participating in that. For every year and all the time, they say, cursed be Haman. And so these are, there's a poem where she laments each of her 10 sons. And we just see here the drama of her grief. And this is a study in speech in character, which is a familiar technique from Greek and Roman oratory, 
and the way orators were trained and actors were trained to improvise and to rehearse speeches in the voices of characters. And just as we know that orators in late antiquity had prompts such as um, you know, imagining how Niobe would speak mourning her, the death of her children from you know, Greek mythology, we have here, we can imagine Zeresh mourning her children, only it's carnivalesque. And he's not really, they feel some compassion, we might say, but not really pity because he was their foe. And um, so she's mourning them, and we have uh, flown from my palace. This is the last stanza on this page. It's not the last stanza of the poem. Flown from my palace are my ten chicks, and my heart, my insides melt within me. Bereft of all my kin, I sit. Alas for her, for what happened to her, for the fate of her son, Arisai. And I have just an image from, a really striking image from the Leipzig Mox door, which depicts Haman and his ten sons hung from the gallows, a tree. And then uh, that's Haman, they add, the Midrash adds Haman's daughter, um, who empties a chamber pot on what she thinks is Mordecai's head during the parade of Haman. Um, but, but actually, Mordecai on the horse, you can tell he's got a crown on, but also a little Jew's hat hanging off his back. Um, so he's got the crown on, so that's Mordecai. She carefully misses the figure she thinks is her dad and empties the chamber pot on the person who actually is her dad. And then she is pictured there, um, dead or bereft over the fate of her father and brothers. We also have um, another poem that I'll just mention briefly, which uh, dress for six, which this is beautifully illuminated. Again, another medieval German Machzor, a, a prayer book for the Jewish year, which it weaves together two verses uh, at the beginning and end of each stanza, and I give you the two verses there. But what I want to is how the, how the manuscript lays it out in Acts, so you can carefully distinguish the quotations from the biblical text that structure the work and the poem that is sort of in between. But the two verses, like the poem, emphasize the splendor, clothing, and crowns. So we can see there, you know, it's a royal diadem in the biblical verses, royal robes of blue and white, and that gold, and a mantle of fine linen and purple wool. Again, very visual. And it also amplifies the piety of the text. And here I have for you just one stanza. Uh, so grace was bequeathed upon her a bit of God's splendor. He merged her merit into that of Abdiel's heir, Saul. This one, using that deific particle again, there's a lot of pointing in the book in Esther's retelling. This one, as she drew near, lifted her eyes to remember for my sake the merit of God's mountain, the ancestors. And this one, here masculine referring to God, prepared for her to be a sign for the rebuilding of Ariel, the temple in Jerusalem. Royal purple, precious, and roving those redeemed by God. O God, redeemer and strong one, after restoring my breath, he burned against the foe, Haman, with his flaming wrath. He remembered he who atoned, Aaron, and weakened the foe. O Adonai, redeemer of Israel, his holy one, blessed are you, O eternal one, redeemer of Israel. And this is just the next page from the Moxel. This, this stanza that I just translated towards the top of the page. So, Aramaic translation, liturgical poetry, often centrality of Quorum begins to emerge, and certainly we see this continues in the Middle Ages. So medieval Jews used the Book of Esther to imagine and understand nobility and how Jews should safely interact with them. Esther and Mordecai were courtiers, intimate with powerful gentiles, the biblical book depicts court intrigues. Mordecai foils a plot to assassinate the king, which is what results in his favor. Rivalries, power struggles among nobles, including informers and assassins. The book reflects real court practices of accruing and calling in favors, what we might call soft, and it models surviving and even thriving in proximity to potentially hostile nobles. We have evidence that Esther was among Jewish interpreters, especially as Jews became more prominent in mercantile and courtly circles as they began to more habitually encounter these other social elites. So Jews used Esther to understand and explain anti-Semitism, and you can imagine how that verse from Targum Sheni, from the second Targum, which talks about all the reasons people don't like us, could become a way of understanding sort of how others view you, that sort of self-alienation um, that becomes very important in the modern period. Gersonides in France in the 14th century based his manual for etiquette on the book of Esther. And here I just have a little charming picture from a Christian Bible uh, with uh, Esther and the king being a pretzel um, 
and it's also a book by illustrated by a woman by an abbess for her nuns. So it's also again we see a recurring interest of women in the tellings of the Book of Esther. So and again they're also they're, they're pointing. So just there's just so much pointing in Esther. And in these books from this medieval period, we also start to have evidence of actual theatrical productions. So I would note we have the image from the Leipzig Mossor, which lays in Esther touching the king's scroll. Then we have the horse being readied for Mordecai. And then we actually have the Jewish man wearing his wooden hood uh, teaching children from a book. So we have this sort of the, the transmission of the story of Esther. Um, and this, this, that page actually has a nice liturgical poem by Collier, whom we already just mentioned. We have in the Maimonides' Book of Holidays uh, from Northern Italy, 15th century, we have actual, you can see costumes. You get that sense of actual sort of, you know, the idea that people were dressing up for Purim in some ways. And then we have this Dutch Christian vernacular uh, illustrated Bible, which has a number of scenes depicting Esther. And there you can see, again, sort of this tableau-like staging almost of the scene with the reflecting the tradition that woman was in fact crucified. So. And in fact in the, the medieval and early modern period is when we have the true evidence of what we would now call a Purim spiel, a Purim play, and the influence of the carnivalesque. Now as early as the 13th century we are told that the ruler, how to get this in there, once asked Rabbi Judah the pious why the Jews bang on the walls every time Haman's name was mentioned during the reading of the scroll, Rabbi replied, according to the number of bangs we bang, so do the demons beat him in hell. So um, lots of, you can imagine again sort of the raucous experience of being in these synagogues. Uh, even to this day, the, the, the Purim spiels can be quite exciting. Full Purim spiel scripts are attested in the fourth century, and they were probably influenced by the emergence of the Faschnachtspiel in, German, in Germany, especially in the vicinity of Nuremberg. And in those Christian carnival scripts, Jews were often characters, and they were either demonized or converted to Christianity. So you can see the poor spiel emerging almost in the version of turnabout is fair play. Originally, the earliest poor spiels were poems performed by a single voice and written in the vernacular. So unlike not being written in Hebrew, for example, like Collier poetry, or much of the liturgical poetry of this period. They often were paraphrased into the book of Esther with embellishments. They sometimes parodied the religious service, so like the sermon or the blessing over the wine. They were usually performed in homes with costumes, away from prying eyes, because we can guess that probably in this period, uh, their non-Jewish neighbors were being mocked. They're often bawdy and obscene in both content and delivery, delivery and we have multiple examples of Jewish community, Jewish authorities trying to ban the performance of these Purim spiels. And even in Frankfurt in 1708, the scripts were burned. By the 16th and 17th century, spiels became more complex and theatrical and draw more on current events and practices, as is still the case today. Um, such as they would have the evidence of a contest between cantors, and they draw more on folklore. And they became actually quite competitive. Now that we're in the early modern period, we're going to turn to the Renaissance. And here's a poem by Mordecai Dacko, who lived in Verona in the from 1525 to 1601, and he was from polymath, he was a rabbi, a Kabbalist, and I would say perhaps a pragmatic because he took a commission to write of Esther in Judeo-Italian, which is Italian written in Hebrew characters, the vernacular of his community, for an audience of elite Greek women. These were women who were educated, but not in Hebrew. They had good secular and vernacular schooling. Uh, and it, it, they were adjacent to wealthy women to courtly society, to which they had some aspirations, but they're also keenly aware of their social and legal vulnerability. In this text, he emphasizes feminine and relatable aspects of Esther, and Vashti, actually, the evil, the queen who is opposed in chapter one. He refers to banquet planning, organizational skills, what we would think of as women's work and sort of a pragmatism to how they go about things. Esther is more emotional, but also more ladylike. She's courtier. And interestingly, Dato downplays minor male characters while he amplifies women, including Vashti, the first queen of Purim, uh, the first queen of uh, Ahasuerus, and then also Zeresh, the wife of Haman. Now for this community, I want to point out, again, sort of like how context shapes things, this Jewish community would have found the life, sort of the, the depiction of Shushan, uh, relatable, because 
Shushan is noted in Jewish law for all the cities. There is a Shushan Quorum, you get an extra day of Quorum um, if you, for, for cities that were walled at the time of the Book of Esther. This is the same time period when Jewish ghettos were being built in Italy. So, so Venice, the first ghetto, was built shortly, you know, 10 years before Dato was born. Rome built its ghetto, established its ghetto in about 50 years later, and Verona, the community in which Dato lived, established its ghetto in 1600, one year before Dato died. So Jewish communities were having experiences of damaging legal decrees, sense of, a sense of vulnerability, despite material prosperity. So in this, they could see themselves in the Jews of Shushan. And this ghettoization was to limit Jewish competition with non-Jews, and in response to growing prosperity among the Jewish community, an immigration of Jews from Germany and Spain and Portugal. So in, in essence, the, these different Italian communities said, build that wall, uh, and they put the Jews in it. So here are just a few excerpts from Dato's poem. It's written in Judeo-Italian, uh, so it's a very Italian poem. Uh, but I just want to note how, like this is the opening, how he addresses the women, specifically congregate women, each and every one, and all of those who do not have the doctrine of the sacred scripture and of the holy words of the prophets. So he's inviting men with lesser religious education as well. And the morning of Quorum or some day prior, while you prepare your meals, come in and in verse from the beginning to end, I will tell you the story of Quorum. And then there's a, some, another stanza from later in the work. So here we can tell line 329. Um, we return to the queen, so he's narrating for you, um, who was by day laid very, by the third day was laid very low. She's fasting before going to see the king. For she was unused to fasting, but even more so she was struggling very much from pain. But with this she was unconcerned. And once she was replenished with food, she broke her fast before going to see the king. She dressed and decorated herself imperially so that she resembled a bright star. So again, that morning star kind of dawn imagery. And then finally, um, uh, this last stanza, I am Dato in his own voice says, I promise you there would be too much if I wish to name all of the foods that came to the table. So he mentioned the, the women that he's speaking to, he's very interested to know about the menu of what was served by Esther at her banquets. He says, I am poorly informed of it. This is part of a growing body of popular vernacular retellings of Esther that we have. So we have Judeo Provencal, uh, which uh, Prescott says was written for women, children, grand grandchildren, and Ladino Coplas, which you can tell from this record cover, continued to be uh, recorded and produced well into the modern period, uh, many which were paraliturgical in function, and many pertained to the very productive cycle concerning Queen Esther. So Esther proved to be very popular in the moment. So where do all these vernacular texts come from? In, as early as the 14th century, we have parodies of the Talmud written by scholars making fun of themselves and their, the genres they spend their day, their, their, most of their day and year in life studying. And these texts refer to a king, which is a Provencal custom akin to the king of fools right in neighboring communities during carnival. The Purim king was elected, but was expected to entertain the community for anywhere from two to four weeks, depending on local custom. And I would say the king entertains, puts on shows to entertain his populace, and the king expects to be entertained. And the poetic retellings of Esther were likely part of this tradition. So here I have a late 17th century Judeo and Hebrew manuscript. So it's all written in Hebrew characters, but some of it's Hebrew and some of it's Judeo-Provencal. And its heading in the Hebrew says, Poems in Vernacular, Ridiculing Haman, which young students sometimes play on the day of Purim. So it tells you there that this is sort of part of Script. It's bilingual, contains stage instructions in Hebrew, and glosses from the biblical book of Esther also in Hebrew. And this work is unfinished. It has put in the margin blank pages, headings without text and things, so it really appears to be kind of a draft. So it's very precious evidence for how these poems that were performed came to be composed. And I would notice in this period that also we see Esther starts escaping the ghetto in some ways. So not just for Jews, and not just for Purim, because at this point in particular, in the 16th and 17th century, we start to see a strong influence from the conversos, Jews who had been forced to convert to Catholicism uh, in Spain and Portugal, who would then flee to more hospitable environs in some cases and re-Judaize. 
And it's, it's no wonder that Esther is the first distinctly Jewish play written in Spanish. It was written in 1567 by Solomon Husque, who was born in Portugal. He was a converso, uh, but he was written while he was in Ferrara, and it was translated into Italian by Leon of Modena, so, um, so, who lives in Venice. And so we have here sort of these, this, this converso community. He wrote it actually in Ladino, um, so Judeo-Spanish. And the presence of a significant converso population in Italy, including the Usque family, made adaptations of Hebrew Bible texts appealing. Christian audiences enjoy edifying entertainment on biblical and religious themes, although I was not entirely sure Esther is edifying, at least sort of as it's sort of the Hebrew text. For Jews, Esther was apologetic, a chance to highlight good, heroic Jews, and the Persian courtiers defend the Jews against Haman and speak to the Jews' virtues in these texts. So the non-Jewish characters model for the non-Jews in the audience how to sort of be a good ally. For former or current crypto-Jews, there's a sense of catharsis and redemption because Esther conceals her identity and then is revealed. Um, and for the venue, putting on these performances, you can imagine this is a topic that we get all different strata of the community. I would mention that Luther uh, recommended the dramatization of biblical stories, especially from the Old Testament in the vernacular. Uh, we have Lope de Vega's La Hermosa Esther, which was overtly Catholic but appealed to crypto Jews in Spain, even though they were anti-Semitic. And in France, Racine chose to dramatize Esther for performance at an elite girls' school because he thought it would be, quote, sufficiently easy to dramatize, and that in turn became, the, that's the cover of that Racine, uh, became the basis for Handel's Esther, the first oratorio in English. So sort of like, it's just suddenly sort of everywhere. And indeed, uh, Esther from this early modern period comes to, um, so uh, it's a new world, new worlds are being explored, and Jews are finding new freedom in this new world. And so it's perhaps unsurprising that we see Esther, uh, we see here um, the self-conscious creation of Purim, of parties about Purim uh, for charity. So it seems, it seems it's like a very American kind of thing, that we'll have a fancy party as a fundraiser uh, for the poor. Um, can't just give the money to the poor. Um, so, but we have the state, and so we have, so this is happening right around the time of the American Civil War. And there's an urge, Purim should be selected as the fancy dress ball, the proceeds to be donated to charity. Um, and then we have this report from 1883 of a fancy dress ball, the Purim Association is, is the Academy of Music, so it's being written up in the Jewish newspaper, and there was seated the good Queen Esther accompanied by Prince and Princess Carnival, attended by brilliant retinues and gorgeous costumes. So this sort of tongue-in-cheek write-up, but you can see here ads and uh, invitations and tickets. And similarly, because I live in the state of North Carolina, I was delighted to find out that in North Carolina, rabbis were expressing concerns about Purim galas, which were entirely justified, as the Jewish character of the holiday was taking on a distinctly social and secular culture. Among the costumes at the ball in North Carolina in 1883 were Mikado, the Mikado and Oscar Wilde, one in 1885 in Goldsboro, North Carolina, held the Opera House, featured children enacting the drama of Vashti and Akashverosh. But three years later, the entertainment was the performance of a one-act British farce called A Kiss in the Dark. And Wilmington's Concordia Society Quorum Ball in 1889 featured an elegant supper of the very non-kosher dishes of mayonnaise, lobsters, beef tongue, and ice cream, which uh, I hope is not uh, on the menu for this conference. And this, these in the 1880s, they're really actually at this point, we're just getting to the birth of film. And Esther, once again, she never misses a stride in terms of sort of keeping up with all the different opportunities. And in fact, in, we have the earliest film of Esther is from 1910. It was in France. And we have another one, 1913, also in France. These are very short, and many of them have to be viewed uh, online and through different film archives, 10, 20 minutes long. And then uh, my favorite one in some ways is actually the undertow, uh, which is also called Esther of the People, which is an allegorical retelling of uh, the book of Esther, and that Esther and her lives with her uncle, Mor and he works at the factory of Mr. King. <laughs> and, and it's this whole, you know, and, and, um, and there's, lots, instead of, there's lots of letter writing and messengers and things, and it's, uh, it's, it was, uh, uh, I think, considered sort of heavy-handed. 
as, as how agoricultural treatment of esters tend to be. But you can see again how sort of the orientalism and sort of the delight in the costumes and the staging, the opulence that's imputed by the book of Esther, the biblical text, and all the sex and death and drama uh, is just natural. And what we see in these texts are that beautiful women triumph over hapless men, and in the case of the undertow, also over capitalism. Then in the Weimar period, we have Das Buch Esther, which unfortunately, unfortunately seems to be lost. It's, it's uh, and you're, they are lost. But uh, just to note, as early as 1919, three large-scale productions about Eastern Jews beset by anti-Semitic agitation were released. Today, all of these films are considered lost. Only the thematically related but somewhat later film, Die Gesagneten, by Carl Theodore Dreyer has survived, in which an impressive detail describes the origins of the pogrom. So in a way, you can sort of hear the echoes of Esther in this film. It depicts how, for selfish reasons, an agitator spreads hatred of the Jew and eventually sparks murder and expulsion. There were also several films in the post-war period dealing with Jewish subjects in biblical times. We do, however, have this still from the, from the film, uh, which is unapologetically sympathetic to its heroic and attractive lead character, that's Mordecai there, um, played by a Jewish actor, uh, who was also a director of the film, uh, Ernst Riker, and to the victimized vulnerable Jews of Shushan. Haman is emphatically not to executed by a Jewish mob, but is sentenced to death by the king in a somber, sober, legal process, along with his co-conspirator, Vashti. So, um, again, so this is sort of a uh, film propaganda using Esther as a model of how Jews can navigate their place in Gentile society. Quite different, and several decades later, is Esther and the King, uh, sort of a spaghetti Italian uh, American film. Swords and Sandals and Eisenhower it is, as one uh, the New York Times referred to it, a spike in the coffin of synthetic biblical films. It was widely panned. Uh, so, but King Ahasuerus is a sober, noble, virtuous king. Vashti's having an affair with Haman, uh, makes it all very palatable what happens to the two of them. It's framed as a universal love story with love triangle elements. Esther has a Jewish fiance, Simon, who fights the king over Esther. It's a very conservative and conformist retelling um, that emphasizes the whole rise of the idea of Judeo-Christian ethos. And everyone says that the good people all support liberty and democracy. Intriguingly, Esther also favors a progressive, uh, progressive tax policy over Haman's flat tax, which again, that's sort of like a link back to the undertow there. Um, it's transformed into a melodrama and stripped of all humor. Law is taken very seriously as a source of stability and societal harmony. Law is not a problem, but a solution. And it has lots of uh, Orientalism and uh, dancing girls. So as you can tell from that poster. Quite good is Amos Kitai's uh, staging as statement uh, production. Um, the dialogue in this Israeli film is largely taken from the text of the biblical book, although it's abbreviated, uh, which means that the director more directly confronts the violence of the final chapters and adheres to the sparest of the biblical plots. And really the violence is, is what uh, Hitai is getting at. He uses the biblical violence to speak to the cyclical nature of brutality and revenge in the contemporary Middle East, uh, from the book of Deuteronomy uh, to the present. He films it in the ruins of an Arab village outside Haifa. Uh, the sense of an ancient unsettled score that has simmered for centuries is almost pal palpable in this beautiful but ravaged territory. The juxtaposition is how overwhelmingly the region's history continues to haunt Israel's present. That was a review in the New York Times. You know, there are burning tires and trucks driving around in the background and cars hon honking. Um, but the language is very biblical, which was great because my students, and we were reading this in a Hebrew class, could actually follow the dialogue because we translated it all. Uh, other critics regarded it as ponderous and heavy-handed. Esther shows up on television too, in the period, in the sort of boom period of family entertainment in the late 1990s and early 2000s. Uh, there were lots of different TV films and miniseries based on Bible stories, such as the Noah miniseries, which also has F. Murray Abraham. He's Noah in that miniseries and Mordecai in this one. There were any number of sort of films this kind, and they reflect what I refer to as this whole ethos. They smooth out and make everything kind of pretty and mainstream and inoffensive. Uh, it's vaguely sort of evangelical, um, but mostly striving to be maximally inclusive. Uh, it opens, probably the most fascinating thing is the historical framing. It opens with a depiction of the Babylonian sack of Jerusalem and Nehemiah leading Jews back to the Promised Land. 
so it's a very canonical reading of Esther. It has soft Zionism. It ends with, the film ends with Ezra reading from the Torah in Jerusalem. Well, Esther is still happy back in Persia. And one way of thinking about it, Ezra and Nehemiah, who were added to this film, they show up nowhere in the book of Esther proper, uh, articulate Jewish particularism. So they're opposed to intermarriage, and they want to return to Jerusalem. Well, Ezra embodies sort of universalism and a more assimilationist impulse. So you can have it both ways. It really wants to make everyone feel seen. But by far the most fascinating recent film adaptation is One Night with the King, which is, I refer to, it makes Esther into a pious, political, perfect incarnation of girl power. Uh, you can see here she has this disco globe that sort of makes a Jewish star that, that resonates on her. Um, the people who filmed it, uh, it's a very evangelical film company, were clearly just in love with the Lord of the Rings movies. There's lots of Lord of the Rings imagery. There's sort of this pseudo Babylonian thing. And then the, that scene of her with the scimitars is nowhere in the actual movie, but the movie poster itself is just fabulous. Um, so in the, the, in the silent film version of the one from 1913, uh, she does physically, Esther does physically interrupt the plot to assassinate the king. She like throws herself on the assassin. So that's maybe a callback to that, but I kind of doubt it. So I refer to One Night of the King as a, a, a distinctly Christian Esther in the era of George Bush. <laughs> created by Fox Faith, explicitly for evangelical audiences. Uh, it has taken all the humor and all the carnival, carnivalesque elements from it. There are unintentional comedy because the contest of the virgins, the, the beauty pageant, uh, has a very bachelor-like aesthetic. And it's really almost painfully earnest in its sense of sexual restraint and modesty. It's very clear that they do not have sex before marriage, even though she's in a harem. Um, she's really the Disney treatment of Esther. She is kind, pretty, bookish. She reads a lot. She makes uh, one of the eunuchs cry because he hasn't heard anyone read Akkadian since he was taken into slavery. Um, and she loves her goofy uncle. She teaches the girls of the harem to read and to love literature. She rejects frippery and luxury and likes modest clothing. And she's what at Duke University, the girls would refer to as, the female students refer to as effortless perfection. Uh, so, uh, and Akashverosh is a Disney prince, charming, often with his shirt off. He doesn't seem real bright, he doesn't have a lot to say, but he's rich and powerful anyway. It is a very, it has a very Zionist message. It, it very much wants, that the Jews should want to return to Israel. She, Esther famously pines to dance in the streets of Jerusalem like King David, to which one of my students suggested immensely with no underpants. Um, and it overlays, perhaps most troublingly, it overlays a very post-9-11 geopolitics onto the story. The Jews are in cahoots with the Greeks to, uni to unite with the Greeks to bring democracy to Persia. So the Jews and the Greeks are going to unite and bring democracy to Persia. Uh, Haman uses lots of explicitly Nazi imagery and pageantry, um, which helps justify the bloodshed at the end. And uh, Vashti is banished because she refuses to support the war effort and quest policy. <laughs> so she's basically like the Dixie Chicks. Um, <laughs> so it's a, it's a politically, a really, it's a fascinating film, but also fairly troubling. Um, and it is uh, really stripped of all sense of being sort of actually connected to Judaism. These films, created for mass consumption, preserve little, if any, of the sly and extremely dark comedy of the biblical text and its pre-modern modern version. Whether cinematic adaptations amplify or suppress the sex, sexuality, and violence, these films share a sense that the Bible must be edifying, uplifting, or somehow earnest, and perhaps even historically accurate, a truly perplexing challenge with the deeply ahistorical Book of Esther. Carnivalesque comedy or absurdist revenge fantasy, not a work that uses humor to destabilize structures that foster discrimination and abuse. And perhaps that is the challenge that all of these films face, whether European, American, or Israeli. Even if they advocate for the weak and disadvantaged, whether they be women, pallid, the working class, beleaguered Democrats, or liberal neocons, they ultimately address the powerful, and the powerful will likely not find the undermining of authority at the heart of a fantasy about the reversal of the status quo so humorous. And yet, perhaps precisely, in our own unsettled, decentered, self-questioning time, Esther will find a new moment. As we see in the Purim episode of the Israeli satire show, The Jews Are Coming, Hayyuzim Ba'im, which we have a 
still from there, um, or a puppet show at the Jewish Museum in Berlin. Uh, and we perhaps after finding a new moment, we also see in the 2022, so just last year, mockumentary, The Red Star, a Purim story from Argentina. This film, which one critic describes as, quote, wonderful, hilarious, and at times uncomfortable and controversial, funny, and at times disturbing, seems true to the sharp-edged spirit of the biblical tale, as does its parody of spycraft and political intrigue, prefaced by a black and white fake newsreel of a spiel with the future of Mata Hari as heroine, as Esther, and that's there. Perhaps this mockumentary is the latest Taylor Esther, a fitting update to the wryly, richly comedic retellings of the tale found in the late antique Targum, the poetry of Dato, and the scripts in Judeo-Provençal. Similarly, the vivacious embrace of Purim, particularly Esther and Vashti, by the gay and queer community in the US, Israel, and Europe, recovered the transgressiveness of both the holiday and the scroll, even as the story of the closeted queen who, who climactically outs herself provides yet another marginalized social group a vision of themselves within the sacred canon. Queer performances of Esther tap into the text's deeply subversive potential, fabulous costumes, which speak to our present moment and highlight how the story continues to empower and even liberate, if only for a time, new communities experiencing legal oppression and social exclusion. Esther continues to give them a voice. And in the end, this talk is really ending now, though it's also kind of just beginning, Esther always seems to give her audiences a knowing nod, whatever, wherever, whenever in time or wherever they might be. Unlike Haman or the king, and more even than Mordecai, we are in on her joke. Yet Esther is always also a little unsettling. She has taken on so many identities, played so many roles, we can always see ourselves in her, and yet still be surprised that we'll in the mirror. Thank you. Laura, thank you so much for this rich, humorous, and in the best sense, entertaining public lecture. Um, we've got a few minutes left for, um, for Q&A, so, Anyone who wants to ask a question, and I'm happy to hand over our cube. I think, I think so thank you very much, Professor Lieber, for this uh, wonderful uh, talk. I have a question, and I, I hope because it was a lot of aesthetic now, and now it's, it's going maybe to be ethical, but didn't mention was, is there any use, because it would make fully sense to me, um, of during the time of Shoah, um, of, of celebrating Purim or not celebrating, but using it as a yeah. resistance. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I ran. I, I ran too late, so I, was, I knew I was going to be long so I cut out things, but this is a grogger from a site. The Hebrew text says, and they hang Haman, so this is a noisemaker for blotting out the name of Haman. Uh, it has a coin, a 1933 German coin, and it's got the swastika in it. And uh, another, this, this is, these are Purmspiels, um, it's from before and after the war, but I think the Landsberg DP camp is probably the most famous because there Haman is explicitly uh, Dressed as Hitler, and then you have Arthur, Arthur Sizik, uh, did the illuminated Megalot. Also, um, the, 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 the Haman Hitler. Uh, it, it shows up before the war as well. I think I don't. I ended up not including it. It's actually in Tel Aviv in the 1930s. There was a porn parade that uh, that had the um, some things. So um, so that was so that was evoked very strongly. But I just decided that <laughs> I, I stayed a little lighter hearted during my presentation. Another question. Tobias. Oh, thank you very, very much. And I could go on listening. <laughs> um, I, I would like to come to a very basic question. Um, we have now all this uh, super rich material. Um, 
And probably we would say this is uh, the biblical character of Esther. Why would you say how long is it possible about the biblical character of Esther and where is this explosion of material something uh, where we go into a space which is completely beyond or where it loses its, uh, or where we should say there's a limit of speaking, a uh, going on speaking biblical character. And I don't have an answer on that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Place it, place it just here. I need the conch show. <laughs> um, but I think part of what keeps it grounded, the Jewish traditions that I'm talking about, is the fact that, it's al that there's always the reading of the actual Megillah during the, during the Purim service in the evening and in the morning. And the Purim spiels are often in that context, but they're, they're, it's, a, like a, it's an annual sort of reminder of what the actual sort of biblical book of S is saying. And so you're more... You're sort of linking back to that sort of source material on a very regular basis. I think um, in terms of what happens in the modern period, <laughs> these are posters for various vacation Bible school uh, programs and things. Um, I like the Esther anti-racist vacation Bible school. I think that's, <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I mean, again, when we see sort of Esther, I think one of the reasons in the modern period she's getting tapped so often, it's actually similar to the reason she's getting tapped so often in the Renaissance, is actually there's this moment of this particular interest in women. And, you know, she's one of, there's, there are two books in the Bible named for women, so there's Esther and Ruth. And I think in Esther is the more, by modern standards, especially sort of the more empowering, you know, she, but at the same time, because you can sort of see here, like, she's, look how docile she is in these different sort of cartoon images. Um, you know, she's, she's sort of, she's feminine, um, and she's sort of compared to the Vashti. I, I, I didn't use, I, I found finger puppets where I found it interesting how Vashti is always this uh, sort of vein on these little cartoon finger puppets that kids are supposed to cut out for Hebrew school and things. Um, so she's sort of threads this needle of being sort of an appropriate feminine role model for this day and age. You know, I think gender norms are so, uh, such a contentious issue right now that um, it's sort of interesting that she, on the one hand, can be read in one community as reinforcing very traditional gender norms. All the, even going back to the Greek, with the fainting and the swooning and, you know, the batting her eyelashes. Uh, at the same time, the emphasis on con concealment and revealment has made her so uh, powerful for the gay community. So I think she can be kind of a cipher, I think, because there's so, it's, it's, she's like a beautiful example of this sort of a gap text, where the, she's just, you can, like, color the motivations and the details. I do think it's very easy, and I think you can direction with like the undertow movie or some of these sort of more the Disneyfied adaptations where I think the, the spirit of it can get sort of more attenuated from the original material. Um, but I think a lot of these traditions are sort of constantly sort of looping back to the biblical text in very conscious ways, which I think makes it hated. Okay, so maybe one or two more questions? I see. Um, and you can direct me. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, adding to what Tobias Niklas said and what I talked about, would you be able to pinpoint certain features in order to st still have the biblical Esther? Or where would you line between just an adaptation or an illusion or a real remaking of the story? Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know that I could pinpoint where there's a line. I, it's more of a gradation, and I don't know that, uh, I certainly have my opinions, but I know at the same time, you know, like, Esther, that one night with the king, I think that's really quite remote, but it was made by the most earnestly Protestant group of people you could ever imagine, so they think they're being tremendously faithful in some way to it, so it's hard for me to sort of, my, what I, my criteria would always be sort of very subjective. I'm going to favor ones that are in some way that don't sacrifice the naughtiness, the, <laughs> the heathen naughtiness <laughs> of, of the original in some way. I think in some ways, Esther, the best adaptations will in some way make you uncomfortable. 
That's why, uh, you know, like the Hayyehudim the, Ba'im, the, the Jews are coming. That, it's like a two minute long little skit and you can find it online and it's, uh, it's subtitled in, 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 in English. So it's very accessible. And, and you know, Michal was saying, she's like, I don't show that in class anymore, it upsets students. <laughs> so, uh, but I think it's, um, it's, it's provocative in that way. I think that's sort of, it's the, and the way that it make, that it encourages people to make structures. That to me, like, the, so I think the, probably the best performances in my mind are probably some of the things that go on in individual synagogue forum, you know, sort of where it's just sort of very responsive to the moment and that kind of thing. It's very closely connected to the biblical text. It's also closely connected to pop culture in a lot of ways. So I think, um, but yeah, I think, I think, you know, the, the best ones is that Esther is a deeply discomforting book. I mean, it's, you're, it's like you're laughing and you're laughing and you're laughing and it's like, and you're not sure if you should still be laughing, but you kind of are laughing. <laughs> and, you know, in that moment where you're just really uncomfortable, like, can genocide be funny? Um, you know, that it's that sort of that, that sort of darkness is something that I think is important, but it's, it's it would always be very subjective, I think, because I think most of the people making sort of these different, you know, adaptations regard themselves as revealing, sort of like distilling the truth of Esther, but, um, but it's, their judgment is not mine. Okay, so one last question, Heidrun. In antiquity, I'd say that characters are more about co um, collectives than individuality. Um, like also, uh, today we are more about it's more about individuality than in antiquity. It's more about collective collectives. Would you say that Esther is a counterexample to that? Would you see more individuality uh, in the character of Esther maybe than in other ancient characters? Thank you. In a way, my first thought, my first thought as you were asking the question was actually, I think they have more fun with the villainesses. Ashti and Zeresh are more individuated as characters uh, in both in the sort of liturgical texts of you know, the Targums and things. Um, in a way, I think sort of, I think wicked characters are a little bit more fun almost. And, and there's a lot of great material actually on Haman also. Uh, as, as sort of the specific, I mean, he's given a very specific biography about why he's such a bitter, wretched man, I think. But I do think that there are, you know, an, a, a, a distinctive character, and I do think I can think of texts, and even going to like the Septuagint uh, editions, where she's rounded out in sort of a, a more distinctive way, and you sort of, you can sort of picture her. At the same time, one of the challenges I always think of with liturgical material, and even that poem voice, and this sort of gets to the idea of the performativity, is the poets could compose poems often in distinctive voices, but they were going to be received and performed over time by different voices and different communities. So I always sort of think like on the one hand, Shakespeare wrote King Lear, but we also always think of Olivier's King Lear. Uh, so you know, the individual performer can really shape how these performative texts were received at compassion and sort of interests that some of these, some of these different poets and uh, playwrights, if we might use that term, would have had for their characters. That's why I think Dato's poem is so fascinating because he's, you know, he's a man and he's really sort of, you know, a Kabbalist and he has all these credentials, but he's taken on this commission to sisterhood, basically, and, you know, at this sort of elite women's club. Um, and he is sort of trying to sort of like amplify what he thinks or they'll want to hear. And so he sort of stresses the female characters and the female concerns and uses Esther as a way to sort of speak to his contemporaries. You know, so I think, and so yeah, I think that she becomes, um, she's malleable in that way. And that's, you know, but in a way sort of like, you know, the, you know this question about sort of the, when do you get, a, how, how attenuated can you get? I think, you know, she's, I, one critic uh, referred to her as wearing masks upon masks, you know, that it's just, you never, you're not sure when sort of like, you know, sort of like you're, you're look, what you're looking at at any given time, it's always just sort of another layer of concealment with the text. So maybe we, you know, but I think that makes her an attractive challenge for storytellers too. Excellent. So please join me in thanking Laura for her lecture and for her answers afterwards.
And now we would like to invite you for our wine reception. Unfortunately, not those who are joining us through social media. There's a certain limit. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. But all the others who are here, you're invited to our wine reception. <laughs>